an update on the current wildfire situation in BC. For today's briefing, we'll have updates from uh, Mike Farnworth, Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, Todd Nessman, Manager of Fire Operations with BC Wildfire Service, Brendan Ralphs, Director of Response Emergency Management BC, and Staff Sergeant Danelle Shoyet with BC RCMP. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up today. With that, I'll turn it over to Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, Mike Farnworth. Please go ahead, Minister. Thank you, and hello, everyone. I'm speaking with you from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. As has already been said, I'm joined today by Todd Nesman, Manager of Fire Operations with the BC Wildfire Service, Brendan Ralphs, Director of Response with Emergency Management BC, and Janelle Shoyat, Staff Sergeant with the RCMP. It's near the end of August, yet wildfires continue to burn throughout the province. Some much needed rain early this week helped crews get a better handle on many of the fires. Welcome news for all of us, and especially for the many thousands of people living in fire affected communities. But the rain has not been enough to fully combat the effects of the already tinder dry conditions that are fueling these fires. We're nowhere near out of the woods and we have to keep working to support our firefighting and emergency management crews. I wanna thank the BC Wildfire Service and Emergency Management BC for their continued work, going above and beyond to bring every resource available from industry to contractors to out of province firefighters to the fire line. We know everyone is working together day in and day out to protect communities. We continue working closely with First Nations, local governments, firefighting crews, emergency response experts, and industry partners to manage issues and work together on strategy British Columbians recover. It's an ongoing collaboration that's part of our commitment to implementing the recommendations of the Abbott-Chapman report, which came out of the 2017 fires. This has been a difficult fire season for many of our traditional mutual aid partners, both across Canada and in the United States. We've brought in resources from all over the country and internationally, from as far away as Mexico and Australia. And I can assure you, our planning and response work starts long before the fire season begins and will continue long after the fires are out. For example, since 2017, September 2017, we've made 77 million available to First Nations Emergency Preparedness Fund to address their challenges and priorities. Applications for flood planning funds. But I also want to note that since the program began in 2017, we've also provided emergency operations centers, emergency support services, evacuation route planning, and volunteer and comp and equipment. Once this fire season is over, I can assure you that our work to support communities and partners is a constant process of relationship building and consensus building and what has been vital, and that has been a vital component of this wildfire response. And supporting community efforts is an ongoing process that will continue in the road ahead. Let me finish today by once again thanking our crews and volunteers who are out there on the front lines fighting fires and helping people. It's been heartwarming to see reports of British Columbians greeting our firefighters on their shift changes and thanking them for their incredible service. Lastly, to everyone dealing with this year's trying season, let's keep working together, taking care and staying safe. Thank you. I'll now pass it over to Todd Nesman, Manager of Fire Operations with the BC Wildfire Service. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks, Mr. Farnworth for the kind words. Uh, BC Fire Wildfire Services responded to 1,528 wildfires for, uh, through this fire season uh, 2021. Uh, it's resulted in 852,000 hectares burned. This last week, we've had 54 fires, and that is uh, largely due uh, to the effects of some of the weather patterns we're seeing. Uh, we're averaging five to 10 fires a day, uh, primarily IA fires, and we've done well in, in containing and managing those. Uh, none of our existing fires have had significant growth, uh, which has been a great. Uh, so our 10 year average is 1,076 fires and uh, 223,000 hectares burned. Currently we have 258 active fires, of which 182 are caused by lightning and 21 by human. 
Uh, current situation, we've had favorable weather this week, which is uh, with the increased precipitation, lower temps, and RH levels have been increased. That's allowed us to make progress on many of our large fires and complexes. Uh, the fire conditions right now are stable in most areas. That being said, we still have areas of concern that didn't receive the precip that came through earlier in the week. Those areas in the Caribou Fire Center and Southern Okanagan still are facing dangerous fire behavior conditions and need to be monitored closely. We've had a slow rebuild of, of uh, fuels in terms of uh, drying out the past Wednesday and Thursday, uh, but the outlook ahead is favorable. Uh, we're going to see a, a series of lows coming through the province that will bring lower temperatures, increased RH and scattered precip, which will be favorable to our crews. In terms of fire activity, we've made good progress. We've been able to tighten many of our containment lines with lower fire behavior. It's allowed our crews to get uh, up and close uh, in many instances that we haven't been able to due to elevated fire behavior. We've been able to use ignition to help solidify some of our containment lines. Uh, it's been a uh, favorable conditions for our teams out there. In terms of resources, currently we have uh, approximately 3,800 personnel out. Uh, uh, 1,250 contractors are currently working. We have 520 out of province resources, which includes 240 military. 430 structure protection personnel and assets are out. We have over 500 heavy equipment operators and, and piece of equipment, 147 helicopters, 38 air tanker aircraft. In terms of recently received resources, we had 153 people arrive from Quebec uh, three days ago. 45 from the Yukon two days ago. We've had IMTs, incident management teams, arrive from Parks Canada, Alberta, and the Northwest Territories to support our efforts. In terms of pending resources, we've got 20 personnel coming from Parks Canada and a number of overhead staff arriving from Eastern Canada um, that should be here in the coming days. In terms of, area of areas of concern for BC Wildfire Service, fatigue is, is something that we have uh, a concern with. Uh, it's been a long summer for many of our firefighters and, and staff supporting the efforts. Uh, with that increased fatigue, we're starting to see more uh, safety uh, concerns come forward. Uh, more slips, trips, falls, those types of events, as well as other serious occurrences are happening. It's something that we take serious and we want to monitor and make sure our staff are safe. Uh, we will be looking closer at our crew numbers with the impending uh, drop off with uh, personnel going back to post-secondary institutions in September, not only our staff, but our contractors is something that we will be monitoring closely and working with our partners to mitigate that shortfall. Otherwise, I, as Minister Farnworth noted, I also wanna pass on thanks uh, for the signs of appreciation we've had for our fireline crews and uh, those helping out. It's greatly appreciated, it's meaningful. And uh, I think it's, it's hit home for a lot of them and uh, they greatly appreciate it. So with that, I'll close and pass it over to Brendan Rouse with Emergency BC. Brendan, please go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to be begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territories of the Wasonic peoples here on Southern Vancouver Island. And now I'm gonna provide a provincial update on some of the latest numbers and messaging around evacuation orders and alerts in BC. So currently in British Columbia, due to the wildfire situation, we have nine First Nations Band Council resolutions, 28 states of local emergency, 75 evacuation orders representing approximately 6,126 properties, and 122 evacuation alerts representing approximately 19,840 properties. As part of our emergency support services that are intended to support evacuees from, these, uh, from the evacuation orders, we have reception centers located in the following communities. Seabird Island First Nation near Agassiz, 100 Mile House in Chilliwack, Kamloops, Kelowna and Lillooet, Merritt, Oliver, Penticton, Prince George, Quinnell, Salmon Arm, Vernon, and Williams Lake. There are also three group lodging facilities located in the Southern Interior, and one additional group lodging facility located in the Southwest region of BC. And we currently have 37 evacuees using group lodging facilities in BC. 
I'd like to close with a few key messages related to evacuation orders and alerts. First of all, I'd like to encourage all British Columbians as part of their emergency, their emergency plan to ensure that they have a plan to stay with friends and family if they can, if they're evacuated. And this way we'll assure that emergency accommodation is available for those British Columbians who truly need it. We'd also like to ensure anyone impacted by evacuation orders that we're doing our very best to keep all evacuees as close to their home community as possible under the circumstances. Finally, I'd like to say that we're encouraging tourists to travel to areas that are not impacted by evacuation orders and alerts. Most of BC is smoke free and not under an evacuation order and alert. We encourage people to consider their tourism and travel there. Thank you very much. From there, I'll turn it over to Janelle Choyette with the RCMP. Hi, thanks very much for having me. And I would like to recognize that I'm coming to you from the tra traditional territories of the Kwantlen, Semiamu, and KC uh, people. Uh, I'd just like to start with saying that I want to reassure our communities that, you know, the RCMP as the police of jurisdiction in many of our evacuated communities um, are in, including those in the central and interior Okanagan, but we're not only uh, the police of jurisdiction, but we're also the provincial police force. And in saying that uh, to date, we've deployed over 500 police officers into uh, the communities that have been impacted by uh, the BC wildfire efforts, uh, the BC wildfires in order to support the efforts that are underway there. Uh, the duties include uh, conducting emergency notification of alerts and assisting with evacuation of emergency orders, uh, conducting ro roving patrols, and also to responding to police uh, calls for service within evacuated alert areas and orders. Um, we've been working closely with our, our partners at the Search and Rescue, um, their volunteers, along with BC Conservation Service, uh, the BC Wildfire Service, commercial vehicle inspectors, and of course our wildfire, um, our, our firefighters, um, and uh, we are working collaboratively with the, the emergency operations centers in the local areas uh, in order to support the road checks uh, that are being manned by private security and MODI personnel. So I know that there, there have been some um, concerns with not seeing us at that road checks, which um, the reason why is because we're doing what we do best, and that is patrolling your communities and looking for signs of criminality or suspicious activity, um, which has not we have not found to date. So I just want to reassure you, while you might not see us at those road checks, we are doing exactly what we're um, supposed to be doing, that is assisting with the orders. And while you're away from your homes, we are making sure that your homes are safe by conducting those proactive patrols, looking and uh, making sure there isn't any signs of criminality at closed businesses and to ensure that while you're away, uh, your uh, homes are safe. If you do have any concerns with respect to what you're seeing on your uh, surveillance video or your CCTV, please, we do encourage you to reach out to the police of jurisdiction, um, with the police that police the community that you would normally live in uh, and express those concerns and we will have somebody go out and uh, take a look. Uh, that ends the, RC the RCMP operational uh, update for today and I think the wildfire update. Um, I'll now turn it over to the minister for any questions. Thank you. That concludes today's operational updates. A reminder to media on the line, you may now press star one to enter the queue and you'll be limited to one follow-up question, one question and one follow-up today. Our first question comes from Derek Penner with Vancouver Sun. Derek, please go ahead. Hi. Yeah, um, Merritt is one of the communities that remains on evacuation alert. Um, I believe it's mainly because of the, the uh, Litton Creek fire still. How much progress has been made on the Litton Creek fire and will that um, result in any change to their alert status? Thanks, I'll refer that question to, uh, to Todd Nesman. Yeah, thanks. At this point, I, I don't have uh, uh, the particulars on the Litton Creek uh, fire and when alerts and orders will be removed. Uh, from that, uh, I'll have to get back to you with that information. Sorry, I think they're making good progress, but I'm not able to give you a, a clear answer on that at this point. Derek, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I do have a follow-up. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, Merritt is is one of the communities that has a, a, an evacuation um, reception center. Uh, but at the moment, though, they they all they are on evacuation alert, which kind of limits their. Um, 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 ability to, to host people from other communities that they, they might immediately have to leave. Um, where are people from the Merritt area supposed to go then? Well, right now they are on evacuation uh, alert. 
Uh, as I said, the, uh, the fire is, uh, is being fought. Uh, they've been on an evacuation alert now for a number of days. Uh, the, uh, the, the cooler, wetter weather has obviously, uh, has obviously helped. Uh, in terms of if it were to go to an evacuation order, for example, uh, then there are plans in place to would send people to other evacuation reception centers uh, in different parts of the province. Uh, and they, uh, as has already been mentioned, uh, Kelowna, for example, uh, Abbotsford, uh, Chilliwack, are all additional places if necessary. Uh, but at the current time, uh, they are just on evacuation alert and that has not been, uh, that has not been a, an evacuation order at this point. But there are, they would be uh, directed or they would be uh, directed to other, to other reception centers if they did have to leave. Thank you. Our next question is from Ahmad Agahi with Global. Ahmad, please go ahead. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, you know, I, uh, obviously we all know much has been made about the Premier's absence during this time, but today for the third time in as many days, I spoke to someone who lost her home in the White Rock Lake fire. And, you know, they're the ones now asking, you know, where he, he is and, and, and they want their loss to be acknowledged uh, you know, in person by their leader. Um, at this time, when they're going through that much, uh, what can you say to them? So we understand uh, what a uh, what a traumatic time it is to uh, to lose uh, you know uh, a property or a home. Um, it it is it is devastating, and we know that, and it's incredibly emotional. Uh, but what I can also tell you is this: is that the uh, the men and women in the fire service are doing everything they can uh, to ensure to not only protect uh, uh, life uh, and property, but fighting the fires. Uh, and the premier is briefed every single day. And he is very much aware of, of what is going on. And I can tell you that as Minister Responsible for Emergency Management uh, and, the, uh, and Katrina Conroy as Minister of Forests, uh, we are involved in every day uh, in, uh, in knowing what is going on, understanding what is taking place, ensuring that uh, what needs to be done is being done, uh, and ensuring that, uh, that uh, our fire services uh, and the men and women, the more than 3,800 uh, fighting those fires uh, with their contractors or Canadian Armed Forces are getting the support they need and are doing everything they can to keep uh, British Columbians safe. Uh, and the Premier is, is uh, front and centre in terms of uh, that awareness. Ahmad, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you, if I may. And I just want to talk about next steps for those who are in the most critical position with having their homes, uh, you know, lost in this. Uh, what can be done and is, is going to be done for them to find housing now, uh, to find schools for their, for their children, and in particularly if someone, you know, we, we've spoken to who may have uh, someone in their family with disabilities who had equipment, had uh, life-saving uh, medication, things like that, that is lost in fire. Well, uh, first then, the, uh, the, the ESS, the emergency support services, kick in in terms of finding accommodation. Uh, there is the online registration, uh, which people uh, have been doing, uh, which also asks about things such as you know, special needs or, or disabilities and particular medications, and, and all of those things uh, are, are made available. The supports in terms of accommodation uh, will continue uh, until you know, people are, are, are back on their feet. Uh, it's not for like a month and then it ends. Uh, at the same time, uh, over the medium and the broader, the longer term, um, the ministries are working together to ensure that we are able to, you know, identify those issues around schools that uh, that uh, kids may need to be attended to, uh, helping people uh, find that long term uh, that, that long term accommodation they may, may need, but also on top of that, uh, directing them to the resources that they may also have. So, for example, obviously one of the key questions is, do you have insurance or do you not have insurance? For example, those are all kinds of things that we are able to to assist people with our next question is from colton davies radio nl colton please go ahead hi there thanks for doing this um you mentioned the issues with uh, fatigue for crews on the ground i i guess this is for todd nesman and um for example in storm, i know crews are sleeping in tents everywhere and um we've had some rain this week and crews are tired and getting rained on in their tents and We've heard that managers in Salmon Arm are staying at the um, Prestige Harborfront Resort nearby. So uh, when you talk about fatigue, would the BC Wildfire Service consider moving fire crews to hotels or, or even having crews switch with managers? And um, I, I know it's probably commonplace, but just curious uh, why there might be that discrepancy with crews um, sleeping in, in tents and, and management apparently staying in hotels. 
Thanks for the question. Uh, the one piece I would mention there is, is I'm not certain uh, whether it's management or whether it's our incident management team that's out there supporting the incident and providing overhead. I know at one point they were set up in, uh, in the prestige, I believe. Um, but as a fair comment around the accommodation for our crews, it's one thing that we look at. I know accommodation has been a challenge, and especially in the Okanagan area. As many people as we have on a fire. So uh, it is something that we monitor and, and the incident management team that is on site is, uh, is playing close attention to that with our crews and how they're doing. And it's not uncommon for them to swap out and have them go to hotels if they're feeling uh, overly fatigued and down. And, and that's a practice that we commonly will use. But um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for the comment though, and the question. Colton, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, and I appreciate that answer. And um, I'm not sure who this is for, um, but uh, Logan Lake had its evacuation order lifted today and um, the Tremont Creek fire got uh, pretty dangerously close last weekend to some homes and meters away, uh, maybe 30 meters away, not even. Uh, but no structures were lost, no homes were damaged in town. And uh, today the mayor credited, uh, obviously, the uh, wildfire crews and local fire departments that heavily resourced it. But she also said that years of fire smart measures and preparations uh, helped save parts of the town where that fire encroached. And Logan Lake was Canada's first fire smart community almost a decade ago. Um, I'm just curious, how widespread is this, you know, fire smart designations for communities in the interior where the fire risk is obviously higher? And um, if it's if it's if all the communities maybe aren't fire smart, could there be an added focus in the future for uh, getting communities there? Um yeah, no, and that's a, that's an excellent point. Uh, Fire Smart is very much part of the uh, of of being proactive in terms of preparing communities uh, for fire and for the fire seasons. Uh, Logan Lake was very much uh, one of the, uh, as you said, one of the first and one of the key uh, uh, communities to take advantage of that. It's something the government has been uh, 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 promoting and working with local governments in terms of improvement of of, of Fire Smart, and not just for uh, for communities, but also for individuals. Individuals and recreational uh, cabin owners as well. There's a lot of information at, at FireSmart BC on how you can do that, uh, but that is very much part of the of the uh, the mitigation. Uh, and a recovery program that we want to see in place in terms of, of communities going forward. Uh, in, in, in essence, building back better, building back smarter. Uh, and with that, I'll also ask uh, EMBC if they have any anything additional to, uh, to add to that. Thank you for that. I uh, don't have anything specific to add in terms of exactly how widespread, but I can say that the, the fire smart, uh, the fire smart information, that information for homeowners and for communities is widely available and can be applied anywhere across the province. And we certainly encourage all uh, homeowners and communities to look at how they can employ those materials, particularly as we look at the impacts of a uh, fire season like this one and looking ahead to future fire seasons. Our next question is from Marcello Bernardo. Sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, can I, can I jump in on that question first? And I just want to acknowledge the, the opening comment that was made. Um, quite often, we don't spend a lot of time uh, acknowledging the wins we have. And Logan Lake was a prime example where it was a, a very comprehensive uh, response that involved local government, involved ourselves, and involved structure departments scattered throughout the province. So that was one that I know there were crews out there working through the night it was a significant effort. Um, and yes, Fire Smart played a part, you know, the weather pattern played a part and also the effort of our people out there. And, and that's one that I, you know, I wanted to just sort of jump in here and just say that that was a big win. And quite often we, uh, we forget to sort of talk about the big win. So I just wanted to, to spend a second on that. So thanks for bringing it up. Glad you did. Our next question is from Marcello Bernardo with News 1130. Marcello, please go ahead. Hi, everyone, and thanks again for taking the time to take our questions. I wanted to see if the RCMP could maybe elaborate, um, Staff Sergeant Janelle Choyette, uh, has there been any looting in the areas where people have been forced to evacuate? Because I've spoken with some people in areas that are, are already telling me that they're nervous about leaving because they can't guarantee that somebody's not going to come in and just steal their stuff. Yeah, Marcella, thanks for that question. Um, to date, we haven't received any reports and we haven't noted anything um, that would lead us to believe that there is any looting that is occurring. 
Um, again, I just want to reassure people that if you have concerns, then we are in your communities. And this is an excellent opportunity to reach out to your local police and ask, you know, I'm concerned, I've seen something on my local television, or can you just, while you're going, going through your community and conducting those um, proactive patrols, reassure me that you've been by, had a look at my that my home, and you can't see any signs of criminality. But we have not to date had any reports of looting or any reports of any other criminality um, received in any of the evacuated order areas. Marcella, do you have a follow-up? I do, and this one is for um, Public Safety Minister Mike Farmworth. If you could elaborate on what concerns, if any, you have about the rebuilding of Lytton, BC, we're now starting to see legal aid action being taken by people who have assessed blame before we know what the exact cause of the fire was that tore through that village. Um, are you able to give us any kind of update on what's being done to rebuild that community? Like you said earlier, people have to get their kids back in schools and, and need to get their lives back on track. So what kind of timeline are we looking at to rebuild that community? So obviously the, the lawsuit is a, a private uh, lawsuit, uh, not a government one. And so I, I'm not in a position to comment on that. But what I can tell you is, is that we, we're working at tables, cross ministry tables uh, with the community, with the, uh, the First Nation on how rebuilding will take place, identifying those critical issues. So for example, schools, uh, accommodation to ensure that they're in place uh, in a timely fashion. So you're going to have the, you know, obviously short-term aid, then you're going to be identifying and working on those, those medium-term uh, solutions. And obviously going back to school is one of them. And then of course is the longer term, which is building back that community and building it back in a way that not only makes it more resilient, uh, but ensures that it, uh, that it continues for the long term. Our next question is from Sinjin Alexander, CTV. Sinjin, please go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, Todd, this is a question for you. Um, of course, this is something we don't think about. There must be fatigue. We're going back to that. Um, this is a dangerous job. How bad is it this year? Have you seen it this bad? And, and what do you need? I hope you can be candid here. What do you need to make things better for the staff? It's a hard season. I'm not going to lie. It, it, it's difficult. You know, when you have fire crews that are out there doing, you know, three tours, four tours in a row, and the season's still, you know, a month more left. It, it is trying. It is difficult. And uh, you know, is it and is is it any worse than previous season? Um, it all depends. Uh, in seventeen and eighteen, those were tough seasons as well. Uh, you know, the length of the season in seventeen was was very trying. This is similar. We're 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 using the lessons we've we've picked up from those tough seasons, and we're trying to help mitigate some of the fatigue measures with our staff and paying attention to that. And, you know, if people need more time off, we're trying to provide it. So it is a difficult, difficult uh, one to sort of quantify and give a, a solid answer in terms of which is worse. Um, uh, it, it is a personal level too. Some people are, are, uh, are built for this and some people it, it is, it's more of a slog on them as well. So, uh, and that's one thing about organization we're diverse and we're made up of all sorts of different people. But I will just say it is it is a trying season and and uh, folks are doing a good job of getting through it. And thankfully, everyone has, for the most part, stayed safe and we haven't had any uh, significant injuries or, or accidents uh, due to fatigue. But now is the time that we have to pay attention to it. Sinjin, do you have a follow up? Thank you. Uh, this question is from Mr. Farnworth. If the team said to you, look, we need more money, we need more resources. Do you have that money and would you give it to them? Absolutely. We spend what's required to fight fires. Uh, money has never been an issue uh, in any fire season. Our next question is uh, from Hina Alam, Canadian Press. Hina, please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is a question for Minister Farnworth. Uh, I was one, uh, I'm looking at an internal memo uh, uh, that's dated July 12th between the BC Wildfire Service and forestry officials. Uh, and um, I was wondering, uh, is it common for uh, the wildfire service to go to the forest industry groups and tell them to use their own equipment and personnel because the government doesn't have enough resources? What kind of a contract or what kind of help and management do you get from forestry groups when fighting fires? Uh, first, I'll make a couple of points. First off, that's not an internal uh, BC Wildfire Service memo. 
Uh, it is an interpretation of a meeting that was taking place between BC Wildfire Service uh, and, uh, and uh, forest companies. Uh, and those meetings have been going on. In fact, they are one of the most important aspects to come out of the, uh, the Abbott-Chapman report of 2017, which re recommended uh, increased uh, uh, cooperation and collaboration between uh, the wildfire service uh, and, uh, and and forestry uh, forest companies, for example, and that's exactly what's being take that's exactly what is taking place. Uh, and what's really been remarkable is how the uh, the fire the the forest uh, companies have stepped up this fire this fire uh, season, working extremely closely uh, with wildfire service. Uh, and what that memo actually refers to is, in fact, the backcountry fires that are not uh, impacting communities. Um, or, or structures or, uh, or, or people, and in terms of what would be available to, to fight those particular fires, because the focus is always on, um, is always on communities interface fires. Uh, the forest companies have been uh, uh, stepping right up in uh, providing equipment, uh, collaborating with us, and, uh, and to suggest that uh, that, that, that memo is indicated as something wrong is, is just erroneous. Hina, do you have a follow-up? I do. Thank you for that, Minister. Uh, I was also wondering if you can tell me what the dollar figure uh, is for uh, the budget is for, uh, this year for fighting wildfires, and how uh, and how much have we spent? Uh, have we gone over the budget? Uh, uh, and uh, how much more do we need? Uh, what resource? What more are we lacking, or what? What are your concerns? It's we're not lacking anything. Uh, we spend what we have to spend. There is no budget. Uh, in the sense that uh, you spend what is required. Uh, there is always a nominal uh, amount of money that is put in the budget uh, uh, every fiscal year when the budget's tabled. Uh, I think this year it's about 100 million, but we spend what we have to spend. So if it's 300, it's 300. If it's 400, it's 400. If it's in a really bad season, such as 2017 or 2018, it could be 650 or more uh, million dollars. Uh, money is not the issue. Uh, fighting fires, keeping communities safe, protecting property, that's what that's what the wildfire service does, and uh, that's what they do incredibly well. Um, it's it's that's that's we spend what we have to spend. That concludes today's information update. Our next scheduled update is set for Tuesday afternoon at two p.m. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Great. Thank you.